don't know how to do this part. It wasn't that hard. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you for being here. A lot of you are family and friends, and it means so much to my heart to see your faces. Uh, I'm going to read a collection of poems that are new to the world. I've only been writing poetry for about a year and a half, and some of them I've only written in the last few weeks, and one I finished this morning at 6 a.m. Wow. Whoops. Uh, Maya Angelou says that an unspoken poem is a half-finished poem, so we, I'm going to offer these poems to you and give them a full life. The first one is called The Entirety of My Universe in Three Sentences. The first one imploded in the black hole of motherhood. My baby's first cry, retching universes apart, birthing a new one. I am born again. I am sun and moon. I am celestial. I hear the sun lilt good morning, her gold piercing the gray sweetly, treetops suddenly ferociously gold and green like a marquee blazing to life. I am invited to a world of technicolor to which I open my door to let her in and am made briefly glorious. Joy finds me in the contours of my nanoscopic existence, incurably content to find all I need in my children's eyelashes, the sounds of my mother's laughter, learning the names of the clouds, standing in the sun's baptismal light. Uh, this one's called, How Much Does the Heart Weigh? A dissection of my own exposes its heft is heavy, a boulder it sinks. Surprising, isn't it? The weightiness of love it plummets. Quaking with laughter, gravitational grief pulling, sighing so bodily, loving, God, I love loving, contentedly it is falling. Living hurts a little, down, down through the ocean that roars and splashes between my rib cages, calling out to the rib sky and shouting, isn't it all so glorious? Uh, uh, this is kind of fun, you guys, isn't it? As bad as I was imagining for weeks. <laughs> I also want to uh, point out Patsy to you. I'm here because of Patsy, my neighbor, who was a longtime poet, and she's taken me under my wing, and um, yeah, so I'm here because of you. Uh, this poem is called The Second Chord, and I dedicate it to my mom, who's back there. I'm just going to point people out during the next whatever. The Second Chord. The first, the first chord spun in a womb-sized orbit, nine months as conduit, linking me to my mother. The slippery life rope severed after my first ragged breath, blue hues starting a race to the NICU, my mother's heart running after me while her worn-out body stayed put. The second chord erupting from her bleeding heart, unseen, unfurling, down empty corridors, around corners, past the doors marked medical personnel only, wrapping around the legs of the nurses, but not tripping them while they worked my blue body to angry red. Then, trailing behind me from her heart to mine, squeezing under door jams, onto school buses and boyfriends' cars, into college classes and apartment bedrooms, the dizzying length of it stretching far, far to other cities and countries and folding in on itself when I return home to her, never outgrowing my mother, for even in my most highbrow adultness, I want to drape myself on my mother's back as she washes the dishes, tell her all the ways the world has hurt me and all the things that I love. Um, this one's called Lies We Tell Our Children, and it was inspired by the moment that my daughter Vera, who's here, yeah, Vera, um, the first time she fell and scabbed her knee was Halloween, when I think she was three, and she was so distraught by this injury on her knee, like, what is this pain? And it made for interesting Halloween, and I've never, uh, the, the, the memory of her uh, 
strickenness has, has kept with me. Lies we tell our children. Your body will heal itself, we console, while dabbing blood off knees, formerly unmarred. Make it go away, pleads child-sized soul, stricken, but I cannot. We all walk around bleeding from heart wounds unhealable. It'll be okay, we whisper to salt plains on cheeks. It will not be okay, but you will be okay, because humans are like ants, carrying 20 times their body weight. We are all walking miracles. I'm fine, we smile lie. You're too young to know the meaning of W-A-R. Time eats us alive, everything is dying. I don't know how to tell you that love hurts. Its beauty will pierce you. Uh, this next one's called Pay Attention, and I'll go ahead and clue you in that this is the one I finished at 6 a.m. So, if the end of it sounds rough, it's okay. <laughs> pay Attention, part one. How wondrous the living when I remember to pay attention, it being rather difficult amid the thinking, planning, doing, cooking, cleaning, scolding, praising, working, regretting, dizzy, tizzying, forgetting, remembering, remembering just in time. Oh, I almost forgot to pay attention. Catching the last minutes of sunset, velvety clouds wearing celestial hues of mauve and white. The aging sun's been singing outside my window this whole time. Silly me. Part two. Have you ever fallen in love with a carrot? Washing it and remembering it comes from the earth, peeling it and thinking, this is good. Slicing it while your heart sings for the soil and the farmer and the sun and the rain, the life of the carrot wholly given, remembering what someone long dead once said, God walks among the pots and pans, and maybe she does. Part three. Delight hides itself in the details of life waiting to be found by those looking, that is to say those living with senses awakened to the endless everywhereness of beauty and wonder. Just today, I saw my hands as if for the first time and praised their cleverness marveling at the soft pads that crown each finger and sitting beside the storyline crevices crisscrossing my palms that clench and let go, clench and let go to the rhythm of my drumming heart, blessed thing that I am still learning to love and listen to. And when I do on occasion, I hear it thrumming a benediction steadily. Pay attention. The secret is in paying attention. Thanks, guys. Um, this one's called Resurrection Song and inspired by a true event. The plant was the deadest thing in my house. Brown leaves curling fist at me, walking by, rasping. I was thirsty to my calves, echoes, echoes following me. I didn't mean to forget day after day to offer it a cup of water. I cannot unhear my failures. What else have I left thirsting? Perhaps I did not underwater, but over. My internet re research says I either loved its once lusty leaves, water falling over clay pots too much or not enough. Maybe it actually shouts, you drown me to my back, still knotted and burden carrying. I've spent my days puzzling out how to care and carry. I need you to know that I tried. I put the dead thing out in the sun and the rain, tired of seeing my failure, till one day an eruption of green miracles, sturdy stubborn leaves waving at me. I live, it chortled. Face to face with resurrection, I felt my body give birth to joy. The prophets promise joy comes in the morning. Sometimes life needs to hibernate. Maybe I'm not a failure after all. I walked by that plant this morning. And it still does something to me. Delightful. All right, this one's called Frank, who I'm married to back there in the amazing airbrush shirt that says Sarah and Frank, Summer of Love. I have a 
matching one I did not wear, but... And I also, uh, so this coffee is about him. And it's also, I want to give a special shout out to Soma, which is where so much of our early years of art story started. So, go to Soma after this. They did not pay me, I'll tell you that. Bells told loudly the first time I ordered coffee for two, not one. Stone church tower kind of bells, you know, the kind of bells that herald a proclamation, a celebration, to love, to love, to love. We drank deeply from the cup of joy and sorrow. I once sat near a couple wrinkly and bent, hip touching hip in a waiting room. Their companionship rippled off them. I bobbed in their wake in my wanting for us to grow old together for our wrinkles to be each other's road maps. I want to search for your age-spotted hand in waiting rooms while you walk behind me to make sure I don't fall. Let's end our story like my grandparents, unable to live without each other. They let go of life months apart, cause of death, broken hearts. The truth is, I never want our story to end, but I hear that death is a requirement for living. Uh, this next poem is really special to me. Um, my family, the Wilsons, have owned the same land for seven generations up near Paragon, and it is a vital part of my family's life. And um, uh, so this poem is inspired by the land that I, we've loved for a long time. It's called Seven Generation Dirt. My child smells of the dirt she played in all afternoon, and I find it lingering the sunshine in the soil, in the folds of her neck like a clerical collar. Plunging my nose into the earthy, priestly scent, I laugh in delight, cheek to dirt smudged cheek. My child smells of the dirt that carries the scent, the ghost of a daydream of a life on the land that I love. For perhaps I'd find it in the soil, in the nightly readings of the almanac, in the cloudscapes gliding, in the wind whistling, I'd find it, happiness, in the rows of green beans singing to be picked. My child smells of the dirt, generations of her people toiled and tilled and bled on, seven generation dirt caked under her fingernails, grainy millimeters of Thomas and Orpha, John and Catherine, Otto and Meta, Lawrence and Sarah, Rudy and Mary, Richard and Pamela, the dirt still holding their stories and laughter, their travails of yearly crops, their just getting bys, their passing on to the next generation to which my child will return to the dirt. Okay. Um, this one's called Jawbreaker and I'm still trying to figure out my voice, but this one I, is a little unusual for me, and uh, we'll see how it comes across. Also, I want to say that it was inspired by this moment of brilliant happiness after spending a day in Portland with Frank, biking on the hilly streets, uh, and hiking an old growth forest, and my happiness uh, was unmeasurable. So this poem is inspired by that. Jawbreaker. I will break my jaw, gladly, delightedly, opening wide, wider now, to catch all the living, tasting, swallowing, gulping, delicious life, so much goodness before death swallows me. On an insignificant Tuesday, I decided I liked myself and ached with the loving. I am a blue whale, consuming more than any other mammal on earth. Jaw open wide, wider, catching the krill-sized beauty. I am kept alive by living. I am satiated. Loving begets loving, aching begets aching, living begets living, Tuesday begets Wednesday. I hurt with how glorious it all is. Do you hear me saying, ah, jaw wide, wider, widest? Uh, 
Um, this poem is also inspired by Vera, back there somewhere, who has been sleeping in our bed since day one. So I would like to the doctor at visits whenever they'd ask me if she was sleeping in her own bed. And I'm like, yes, no, she sleeps with us every night. On your morning of your fifth birthday, I wonder, how will I measure the passing of time when you outgrow our bed, us? My heart will break, I am sure of it, when you cease to hear the invisible call in the dead of night, pitter-pattering, cocooning yourself between us. For I mark the days by the length of your legs that used to curl around my ribcage, inside the C-shape of my body curling around you. But now, your toes tickle my shins. I lay at the edge of the bed to make room for your long limbs, lithe body. Surprised you can't hear my heart. Thump, thump, it sings, song without end. In sync with the tick-tock of time never stopping. But who is keeping track of time? The mothers are. Brevity and beauty breaking our hearts. Tick-tock, thump, thump, tick-tock. Slow down, please. In the mornings, we wake up forehead to forehead. Your warm breath is a benediction to no wonder. I meditate on your long eyelashes as gray melts to gold and all is right in the world. is about a whittled spoon that I watched my friend uh, Anthony make in Colorado while sitting on his front porch. He took a branch and he turned it into a spoon and it was like pure magic. And I still have the spoon. We use it all the time. So this is inspired by that spoon. The mother takes up whittling. The mother smooths out the world like a whittled wooden spoon, spends her nights rounding the hard edges of living and presenting something palatable so soft and good, until tiny hands form calluses. When are they ready for the world in its true form? They'll soon discover splinters. Mother love is hiding the truth behind her oak tree of a body. I think I will read two more. Um, this one is about wonder, and I want to, uh, the, 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 first, the first stanza will, will kind of set the scene, but I, I have this vivid, amazing memory of something I saw like 20 years ago. I was walking, and all of a sudden this bicycle whizzes by, and the man is playing a violin while he bikes, and I was like, what is this magical thing I'm seeing? It has stuck with me, like right there, and um, a, a poem unfolded out of, out of it. It's called, I Met Wonder. I tripped over wonder the first time we met, sidewalk riveted by the sight of a man bicycling, pedaling with feet, of course, while his hands played a violin, yes, really, so beautifully that my eyes and ears followed until he was a speck on the horizon. Wonder leaned close, whispering, the secret is a not forgetting. The ordinary and extraordinary are mired together. She left me laughing. If you look, you'll find me. The very next morning, I heard the sun singing good morning, hun, on her daily rise, and found songbirds peeking in my windows to chatter over coffee. I caught people pirouetting on their ways to work and snug up on the cauliflower, having a quiet conversation with the Brussels sprouts when they thought no one was looking. But I was looking for wonder, and having found her, I learned the language the wind speaks, made my bed in the grass, and watched the clouds waltz. I laughed till I ached and cried till I sighed, for we are all walking miracles. I pretended death is a call for all of us because I need my parents to live forever. I planted flowers for my children to befriend, sunflowers and snapdragons that will talk to them on summer afternoons and shade them from the sorrows, at least for a little longer. 
until wonder is well rooted in their pint sized souls and they look for her everywhere. Wonder. Okay, I don't remember how many I said I was going to read, but I actually definitely just have two more. <laughs> I have like six more I could read, but I'm going to read two more. Okay, this one's called The Stone. It pinned me to the earth, gray weightiness laid me flat, the rise and fall of my chest, shifting the mountain but never conquering it, till one day I lifted my arms, not to heave, not in flight, but to wrap around its heavy girth, embracing the stone that weighed me down, for after such long years lying on the earth, Tiny roots emerged from my shoulder blades and calves, heels of feet and long slope of back, crinkly roots swan diving, unfurling down, down, down into soil rich, so much living happening under the earth. I am home amid the earthworms and fungi, weeping willow roots and creeping thyme. I am made more human in my lowness, and perhaps I'm not meant to fly but grow roots. poem, if I can find it now. It disappeared. Hold on a second. It's here somewhere. Oh, I could look at page numbers. That would help, wouldn't it? Guys, while I look for some this hiding in here, you guys take a deep breath and look at the person next to you <laughs> and tell them hi. <laughs> guys, where'd my poem go? Hi. Oh, it's right in front of me. Okay. Uh, this one was written out of a place of uh, perhaps jealousy for people that have their MFAs. So does anyone here have their MFA? Okay, no, okay, then we're fine. Do you guys know what an MFA is, right? Yeah, okay, I want one someday, maybe, we'll see. Um, the reason I, this, uh, so I read lots of poetry now after discovering it, and uh, it makes my life wonderful and rich, and I always read the poet's bio, and they all have their MFAs, and I'm like, Ugh. so here's my writer's bio. The trouble with writer's bios, this also is my last poem. Mine would be short. Sarah is a mother. Applaud the absence of only or just. As I squint into the brilliance of their bios, smiling with restrained jealousy at their MFAs and academic blather, published books with clever titles. Dang, I wish I would have thought of that. Only and just shout in my ears, and I wish for nothing more then more backbone in the 18 inches holding my head up. Because if I could lift it higher than the status quo, my writer's bio would say. Sarah is a brilliant mother. She once rode motorbikes through Southeast Asia. Being human taught her to write. She skims her fingers over relics and antique stores and sleeps with too many books piled high on her nightstand. Terribly bothered most days with longings, she is soothed by the wind. Discovered poetry when pinned between right or drowned. No published books unless her children count. Yes, two books published, Vera Pearl, Adele Edith. Motherhood is her swan song. Look for this in print someday. <laughs>